This week, I'd like to review the Zondervan Thompson Chain Reference Bible. This is in the 1977 New American Standard Translation. Zondervan has provided me with a hardback copy to review. I'll let you look at the back of the book so you can see the details. And there's the ISBN, which you can also find in the introductory charts. I'm going to take the cover off so as not to damage it as I do the video. So as you can see, the actual outer hide of the Bible is a slick material. It's not cloth over board. The uh, volume is nine and a half inches tall, six and three quarters inches wide, and one and thirteen sixteenths inches thick. Here is a Kirkbride um, New American Standard Thompson Chain Reference, which I purchased in around 2009. And so, I believe the newer edition in the hardback is slightly larger. The text block here is about two millimeters thinner than the old text block. But I actually like the paper here better. We'll look at those details a bit more later. Here is a MacArthur Study Bible, which is also a hardback. I'll compare the dimensions there. Very close. All around. And this is a Foundation Publications large print thin line New American Standard Bible. Thompson Chain Reference includes the 1977 New American Standard text, which I actually prefer. This is the 95 text, which is also the text that's in the MacArthur Study Bible. And if we have time, I'll say a few words about why I prefer the 77 text. Let's open it up and look at the layout. There's a lot of margin here. Two narrow text columns near the center of the page which is going to help with the drop-off issues towards the center. You're not going to have to worry about the text dropping off into the gutter. Each column is about 39 millimeters wide. There is 83 millimeters between this line and this line. There are about 31.5 characters per line and you can get as many as 60 lines per column. The page dimensions are 233 millimeters tall, 165 millimeters wide. That's 9.17 inches tall, 6.49 inches wide, and it is slightly taller than my uh, 2009 Kirkbride New American Standard Thompson Chain Reference. As you can see, the print here is sharp, but the characters are somewhat thin. They are not printed boldly, my understanding is that Zondervan is going to come out with a comfort print edition of this Bible at some point in the future, perhaps in a year, and it will be very interesting to see what that looks like. I measure the margins at the top to range between 11 and 16 millimeters, the inner margin, and that's I'm measuring from this line into the gutter, is as much as 39 millimeters, the outer margin ranges between 41 and 43 and at the bottom from the bottom of a descender on the lowest line of text to the edge is 18 to 23 millimeters. The font in the text is advertised to be 8.3 points. Uh, when I compare it to Times New Roman, capitals look right at 9 points in height as do the lowercase letters. This Bible font actually is proportioned similar to Times New Roman in terms of the ratio of height between uppercase and lowercase letters. Line height is 3.2 millimeters, so from baseline to baseline, that's 9.1 points, so it's nicely spaced. As you see, verse numbers are at the beginning of each verse in this verse-by-verse -verse format Bible. This text is not line matched, and that's very easy to see. For instance, this line of text here is slightly offset from this here, and in places that may cause a little confusion for your eyes. 
added words in the New American Standard Bible are in an italic font. Let's see if I can find some quickly here. Footprints. Tracked with bloody footprints. So that word is supplied by the translators. And here, gone too far, but I want to show you that the words of Christ in this edition are in red ink. In the New American Standard Bible, pronouns for deity are capitalized. There are um, 100,000 or so references in the side column. They're printed in a 6.5 point font. And these point to the index of chain references in the back. We'll take a look at that later. The paper here has a sheet thickness of about 33 micrometers. I estimate the paper weight at around 30 GSM. It's a relatively matte surface, unlike the, uh, the Kirkbride New American Standard Bible. The paper is relatively white. There's a faint gray tinge to it. There is some distracting show through here. Again, this text is not line matched. So let me show you page 319. So here, we're at page 319, and I think you can see that the line of text on the opposite side of the page is pretty much lined up right between the two lines of text on this side. And that creates quite a lot of distraction for the eye. The uh, print is somewhat non-uniform, although it's very mild here in the black ink. But if you move over to the red, you compare pages... 1261 here with 1295. So here is um, page 1261 on the left compared to page 1295 on the right. 1261 is quite a lot darker than uh, 1295 over here. 1295 also illustrates a problem that you have when you're printing in red and there's black on the opposite side. I don't know how well you can see that, but the background seems almost smoky because of the black on the opposite side of the page. There are no book introductions in the Bible proper, but there are book introductions in the back, and we may see those later. Book titles are in the outside top of the page, as are the page contents. Page numbers are placed at the center bottom in the Thompson Chain reference. There are headings at the inside top of the page, and then there are also headings down in the text. This uh, heading is in about an italic nine-point font. Uh, so there aren't multiple colors in this edition. Everything's in black, but you do have numerous headings. Chapters are divided by chapter number in bold. It's about a 9.5. It's all caps first word in each chapter is also in bold caps. The New American Standard Bible prints quotations from the Old Testament when they appear in the New Testament in all capital letters. So here's one in Romans 11, 8, and 9, and you see in the margin it says parallel passage, Psalm 69, 22. It doesn't say it's cited from there, but at least that gives you a clue that that's a place to look. If you look elsewhere on the page, however, you'll see a quotation here in 11, 26, and 27. This is from Isaiah 59 and 27 in the Septuagint. And there's nothing in the margin there that tells you what the source of this quotation is. Since we're talking about these marginal notes at the moment, there's one here at um, 11, 29 that says there's a parallel passage in Deuteronomy 9, 5. However, when you look here at Deuteronomy 9.5, you see nothing in the margin that points you back to Romans 11.29 as a parallel passage. So there's something of an asymmetry there. In the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, the uh, smaller books, like all the other books as far as I can tell, each begin on a new page. So there's 1 John, starting on a fresh page. 2nd John, 3rd John, Jude. 
So after Revelation, you come to the Thompson Comprehensive Helps, which is in nine sections. The first section is the General Index, which is an alphabetical listing in a seven and a half point font, and it runs 28 pages, four columns. So if you want to know about a particular topic, you can find it here in an alphabetical listing and then look elsewhere in the material that follows to see all the citations. Sometimes a list of quotations, sometimes just a list of verses where that topic is discussed. So as I said, this runs for 28 pages. Very helpful general index. And after that is the index of chain topics. This is the 4,451 chain topics. It's printed in about a seven and a half point font. Some of the entries give lists of quotations and some, as I said, only list references. We move to page 1866. So here's an example. Here's uh, on the topic of faithfulness, unfaithfulness. You see all these quotations here. Um, but here in the Confidence in God, they simply give you places to look. They don't think those are quite as important, so important as to need to be cited, to be written out for you. 1866 begins Bible readings, starting with entry 4130, Abiding in Christ. On page 1879, you find the outline studies of the Bible. And you have some interesting charts like this one, which show sort of the history of the development of various translations. I think this is a bit misleading here when it shows the Wycliffe 1380 translation, depending on both the Vulgate and the Masoretic text. I could be wrong there, but I think, um, I think it depends entirely on the Vulgate. Um, so you have... Uh, some little articles here on different translations, and then you have outlines of various books. Some historical information here. So this is useful. Here you have the kings of Judah and Israel, the chronology of that. So analyses of the various books. Again, satisfying our desire for book introductions. Coming forward is Amos, is Luke. Galatians, First Timothy, Hebrews, Revelation. Okay, at the end of that, we come to character studies beginning with entry 4289 on page 1936. So I've zoomed in a bit here on the character study on Elijah so that you can give it, get a sense for how these things are written. So next is the Bible Harmonies and Illustrated Studies. And we'll just flip through this so you can get a sense for what you have back here. As far as I can tell, this material is the same as it was in the last Kirkbride editions. So we have some maps. Quite a few maps. And after this section we should come to the archaeological supplement. We're in the Harmony of the Gospels here. Jesus' Journeys. Jesus in the Year of Opposition. Post-Resurrection Appearances, Life of Peter, Key to the Tree of Paul's Life, and the Tree of Paul's Life on the left, Paul's Missionary Journeys, Journey to Rome, Topical Treasury Helps for Christian Workers, Christian Workers Texts, 
something here about Bible marking. It's to memorization, Bible marking. Okay, and then we come to G. Frederick Owen's Archaeological Supplement. This begins here on page 2015. It's in about a 10 point font. We go a little farther. All kinds of photographs here, black and white material, articles on various topics. And then after that, on page 2090, you find the Hebrew calendar, which is quite useful to have here. The more familiar you get with these additional materials at the back, the more useful they become. There's then a New American Standard Bible Concordance. It runs for 113 pages, three columns per page, about a seven and a half point font. The main entries here are in bold, all caps. The context lines are each printed on a separate line, as you see here. And one thing, one thing that puzzles me, I think, from a utility point of view, is that uh, clearly this is much better than the old style that you'll find, say, in some of the older Cambridge and Oxford King James Version Bibles, where the uh, Concordance is written sort of as a paragraph, and the entries run one right after another in a paragraph format. And yet that seems to be the way we want to format our references at the bottom of the page these days, making them far less useful. At the end of the concordance, you come to the map index. This runs about 12 pages and two columns in a nine-point font. After the index to the atlas, you have a blank page, and then you have 14 color Kirkbride maps. They span 16 pages. They're moderately detailed. Paper is semi-gloss, but I think you can see some reflection there. It's not as shiny as some of these maps are. They do not go into the gutter. You can see the white here in the gutter at this page. The colorful, not a great deal of detail here on these maps. Here uh, you can see the stitching and the sewn binding, so clearly thread here, another one there. It's like maybe four lines of stitching. Paul's Missionary Journeys. Growth of Christian communities in the first and second centuries. Holy Land today. Piece of heavy paper. And then the normal hardback binding. There is a single ribbon marker. It's only six millimeters wide. It's 35 centimeters long. It's long enough to come out at the corner and be useful. It was inserted at an angle, so it wants to come out like that rather than straight. You can see the gold, gold headband, gold tail bands. There's quite a lot of glue here alongside this tail band. That's nothing really unusual. You see that kind of error from time to time in, in book production. The uh, book lies very nearly flat. It's certainly open and it's close to flat here, and since the text is all the way into the center of the page, really you don't have any issues with having to look at the text as it's bending away from your eye into the gutter. Even here in the center of the book, the references are moving down into the gutter, but the text is on a very flat portion of the page. If we move to the front of the book, See the same binding, and then we get to the presentation page. Fairly simple. The half leaf. And then the copyright page, Thompson Chain Reference, New American Standard Bible with the 77 text. 
77 I think is better than the 95 and we may have time to mention a few reasons I think so later. Compiled by Frank Charles Thompson. I believe I included a brief biography chart on him at the beginning of the video. If I didn't know I was supposed to. And all this material, copyright 77 Lockman Foundation on the Bible itself. Uh, this is printed in the United States of America. First printing in 2021. We'll come to the contents. So this is all material at the beginning. Old Testament books. It's a 66 book Protestant Bible. Comprehensive helps. We've already looked through. It's the index to the comprehensive helps. We have a foreword to the New American Standard Bible. Preface. Principles of translation. Explanation of the general format, abbreviations, and special markings. Then a preface to the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. The analytic and synthetic systems of Bible study. Described here. I'll let you pause this and read it if you like. Explanation of the margin and indexes and journey maps. The principal advantages of this Bible. And you come to the Old Testament. There's a graphic on this page. And you're in the book of Genesis. So here's a close-up look at the font. It's sort of a standard font. Nothing particularly striking about it. But it's uh, crisply printed. It's not quite as dark and bold as I would like, but it's certainly useful. There's uh, some places where the tracking is somewhat close, but no major issues. Line spacing, I think, is very nice. So for a font comparison, I brought in the New Legacy Standard Bible New Testament on the left, and it gives you a sense for the size of the font here. It really is quite small, it's similar to that very small font that's in the LSB New Testament. On the left now is the MacArthur Study Bible, which has a comfort print font. Somewhat larger than that in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. It will be very interesting to see the Thompson Chain Reference with a comfort print font. Finally, here on the left is the uh, darker, larger font in the Lockman uh, Large Print Ultra Fan. We'll say a few words now about the New American Standard 77 edition as a translation. I'll start with my translation continuum. The New American Standard 77 is more literal than the 95, and I want to show you why that is in a couple of places, and maybe make a few remarks about the Legacy Standard Bible that's upcoming. So let's look here at uh, Matthew 4.12, the 1977 has fairly literally now, when he heard that John had been taken. When you look at that same verse in the 95, you see that he has been replaced with Jesus, which would have been fine had Jesus been in italics, but it isn't. And look what they've done here in the Legacy Standard Bible. They have put Jesus in italic font, which is good. That's the way I think it should be. Putting Jesus in makes it more readable, which I believe was what the goal was of the 95 translators. But putting Jesus in the text without putting it in an italic font gives the reader the false impression that Jesus is actually in the text. As a second example, look in the same chapter, but at verse 23. The 77 New American Standard has, and Jesus was going about in Galilee, but it has Jesus in italic font, which lets the reader know that Jesus does not appear in the Greek text there. If we look at the same verse in the 95 New American Standard Bible, we see that the initial conjunction and was taken out, and then the italic font was removed from Jesus, which leads you to believe that there was no conjunction. 
and that Jesus was in the text. So those are matters of literalness. Those are not matters of accuracy. They mean the same thing. We know that Jesus is understood, but it isn't as literal when you include Jesus and don't signal the reader that Jesus is not in the text. It's not less accurate, but it is less literal. So this is the Legacy Standard Bible, and you see what they've done. They've restored the conjunction, but they failed to let the reader know that Jesus is an italic font, as was clear in the 77 text. So that this, in this point, the 77 text is actually still more literal than the Legacy Standard Bible is. And I was disappointed to hear in a video where the uh, editor of the Legacy Standard Bible indicated that they were trying to minimize the use of italic font, or at least not overdo it. I wish that in places like this and in Revelation 13.1 they did use the italics. So what do I mean about Revelation 13.1? The 77 says, and he stood on the sand of the sea, because the dragon is not explicitly mentioned, although the dragon is meant. And putting the dragon in the text is no less accurate than the 77, but it is less literal. Unfortunately, Although the dragon should have been an italic font, it is not, and it was not placed in italic font in the Legacy Standard Bible. So that's enough on the topic of literalness. Now, in terms of New Testament source text, the 77 New American Standard is one of those that has the least affinity to the Byzantine text form, as you can see from this chart. To agreement rate with Nestle Lawn 28th edition, you might think, well, it shouldn't be that high because the A28 came out in 2012 or so. But actually, the Nestle Lawn text hasn't changed very much since the 26th edition. So, this indicates that the New American Standard Bible New Testament translators used quite a lot of independence in making their own choices. In terms of agreement with Tyndall House, it's quite low there as well. And then in terms of West Cotton Hort, it agrees with West Cotton Hort more than any other translation I've scored, more than the old American Standard Version, more than the old Revised Version. Finally, in terms of its affinity with the Masoretic Text, the New American Standard Bible scores the same as the New American Standard 95. It is very much at the left end of the spectrum, showing a very high affinity to the Masoretic Hebrew and a disinclination to stray towards ancient translations or readings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. One other thing you should be aware of in terms of differences between the 77 and the 95 is that the 77 retains the archaic language when referring to God. So here in Psalm, or when addressing God, rather. So here in Psalm 22, it reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? O God, I cry by day and night, but thou dost not answer. So it uses those older uh, pronoun forms and verb endings, like in the King James Bible. Personally, I prefer the 77 translation to the 95. I think the 95 was done with uh, an editorial philosophy of attempting to make the New American Standard more readable, to make it more competitive with the New International Version, and it just goes against the genius of the New American Standard Bible, which was to try to be as literal as possible, still in, in readable English. Uh, so by omitting all those conjunctions and by putting uh, proper names in the place of pronouns, they really did themselves a disservice I hope that uh, the Legacy Standard Bible changes its philosophy towards italics at least a bit and ensures that proper names and nouns uh, that are replacing pronouns are placed in italics, like the dragon. I hope that becomes an italic, the dragon, in uh, Revelation 13.1. I've always been a, a fan of the layout of the Thompson chain. I like narrow columns. I like the verse-by-verse -verse format. 
I like the fact that the margins on both sides are wide. You can use them for note taking. Um, the text stays away from the gutter. It stays out on the flat portion of the page, which is uh, very nice from a readability perspective. The problem, of course, uh, oh, let me say that I do like the paper in this most recent Zondervan edition better than in my older Kirkbride, principally because this paper is less shiny than that other paper. Um, on the downside, you don't have line matching yet. You don't have a deep, dark font, which would be preferable. And um, all these editions, at one point back in the 1980s, you could order a black ink edition of the Thompson chain from Kirkbride directly. I did that at one time. I had an NIV Thompson that I've since given away that I had asked to have in black ink, and it was uh, superior, I think, to this, where you have issues with fading like this, where the ink gets lighter on the page. And you also have the black print on the opposite side of the page coming through. Um, I don't know if Zondervan is going to, when they move to comfort print, have um, a black ink option. I hope so. Um, but if not, at least they'll have a line match text. At least I have I have hopes that they will. Certainly would make sense that they would. And so you'll have this excellent old edition in, uh, in a new font, uh, hopefully with uh, an improved, slightly improved format, and still haul, have all this uh, very useful information in the side column. What I would suggest that they do, however, is to try to make it um, more clear where the sources of Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are, and uh, ensure that parallel passages are parallel at both ends. That is, if the passage here is parallel to 1 Peter 5.4, then the passage of 1 Peter 5.4 should say that it's parallel to Luke 12, 44, or uh, whatever the source is. Well, so I think that's about all I have to say. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, please remember to hit the like button. And if you're inclined to subscribing uh, to this channel, you're certainly welcome to do so. Thank you very much for viewing the video.